Good evening, everyone. Hey. Uh, my name is Harmony Frederick, and I'm the Director of Alumni Relations for the USC Suzanne Dwork Peck School of Social Work, including our Department of Nursing. Tonight, you are a part of the launch of our first event that is part of our new Alumni Career and Professional Development Programming. We heard you, alumni, and students, this will apply to you too. Uh, feedback, both through surveys and one-on-one -on -one conversations that we have for you, have told us that career and professional development, whether it's networking, mentoring, and help in finding employment, remains the most desired benefit our school can offer you. With that in mind, we are developing a program offering both in-person and virtual opportunities to attend courses, events, film screenings, panels, and presentations led by engaging speakers like tonight and renowned faculty who will share the latest research and evidence-based practices. In addition, the school's team of career counselors will support those making career transitions and provide resume reviews, job search strategies, and salary negotiation advice. We will also launch an online professional development and networking platform soon for our alumni to engage and, incre and enjoy increased connectivity to our USC social work and nursing communities, which will allow for informal opportunities for mentoring and connection with fellow alumni and students and friends of the school. Continuing education units, or CEUs, will, have a feature of a, will be a feature of our programming as well. Today, we will be providing CEUs for our licensed social workers attending. So please make sure you signed in at the front and sign out when you leave and fill out an evaluation form as well to earn your CEUs. Alumni and friends will be able to attend some events and workshops for free, like the one tonight, and as a benefit of being part of our alumni family. Many other programs and CEU opportunities will be offered at a reduced cost. Those who make donations in support of our school as a member of our Giving Society, the Advocate Circle, will receive additional discounts and access to events. So next week, you're going to receive a special email message highlighting more about this new program and how you may join the Advocate Circle to receive even more benefits. You will also be receiving the first issue of our new Career and Professional Development email newsletter, which includes useful career tips, job hunting strategies, information about upcoming professional development and continuing education programs, and much more. So, without further ado, I would like to introduce you to an important member of our school's staff who is spearheading the launch of this program, Juan Macias. After graduating with his MSW at USC in 2002, Juan worked as a therapist in an evidence-based program and later as a medical social worker. He joined the staff of the USC Suzanne Dwork Peck School of Social Work in 2008 and served as the Assistant Director of Career and Professional Development, where he focused on developing non-traditional social work internships in private industry and nonprofits that may not ordinarily hire social workers. Now, Juan is our Associate Director for, career and, for Alumni Career and Professional Development. His role is dedicated to advancing the careers of alumni at our school. Juan will be leading our presentation this evening. Please help me welcome Juan to the podium. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, on behalf of the USC Suzanne Dvorak Peck School of Social Work, which includes the Department of Nursing, I want to thank all of you for joining us tonight. And I'm talking to all of you here, um, as well as all of you who are watching this via live stream. Um, we're very excited to be offering our first fall event um, that's going to be offered and is being offered to alumni, to students, to friends of the university, faculty, staff, and of course all of us who are watching via live stream. Thank you very much for joining tonight. Um, we're recording today's presentation so that this can be the gift that keeps on giving um, so that we can offer it to uh, other uh, social workers as well. Have you ever wondered how social workers can engage athletes and sports teams to be agents of change? Have you ever thought about what sport social work is? Uh, how about um, if you have and if you've been interested, um, do you know some strategies that you can keep in mind um, as you're trying to break into this emerging field? Well, today we are going to hear the answers to these questions and so much more. Um, we have some great speakers for all of you here today, and we're very excited. Before we do so, um, I want to have the privilege uh, of introducing Dean Marilyn Flynn, our transformational leader who has supported social workers in areas where no social workers have ever gone before. 
Uh, Marilyn Flynn, PhD, is dean of the Suzanne Devore Peck School of Social Work, which includes the Department of Nursing, and to you endowed chair of educational innovation and social work at USC. She is noted for creating transformational programs in graduate education and expanding the frontiers of professionals of social work and nursing nationally. She has championed science and innovation in social work, serving as an organizer of the American Academy of Social Work and Social Welfare, where she co-chairs the National Steering Committee for the Grand Challenges for Social Work. She also serves at USC as the lead of the University Initiative to End Homelessness in Los Angeles. She developed an MSW program with the broadest reach nationally and recently became the first Dean of Social Work to organize and administer a graduate department in an advanced nursing practice. In 2009, she established the first graduate military social work specialization in a major civilian research university. Among num numerous recognitions, she was awarded the International Sarnat Prize for Advancement of Social Work, the National Award for Community and Volunteer Service for, from President Obama, and in 2015, the, US Pro, the USC Provost Inaugural Prize for Innovation in Educational Practice. Please help me welcome Dean Flynn. You know, one, I think your introduction was longer than my remarks. <laughs> um, <laughs> whoa. Uh, well, thank you very much. You know, this is really wonderful. I, I've been here as a dean for 21 years, hard to believe, right? And I can recall when we really struggled to get eight people, eight alums, to come back even if we offered to pay them dinner, give them dinner. <laughs> And um, it's so gratifying to think that you have this level of interest and I know what it takes to come after you've had whatever you had in a whole day of work or a whole day of study to be here tonight. So I really hope this is worthwhile. I'm really excited about the attempts that the um, Social Work Alumni Association is making to, to give you something worthwhile so that when you graduate, you can stay connected with us and you can understand we still care about you. We want you to be famous and successful and rich and happy and anything else we can think of. So we're going to do our best. And please let us know uh, if we're doing it right. And if we can do more, we will. So I don't need to tell any of you here that you've joined probably the most versatile uh, profession on earth and one of the things that makes this such a, a, a valuable lifetime profession is the possibility that you all have of moving from one area to another as you develop your talents and as opportunities arise so this is one of the things that um, uh, led me to be interested in the idea of what one was it, describing to you as non-traditional social work. I thought, if we're so good, and I think we are, then why don't we have social workers in some places where I don't see them? So how about social workers in banks? Uh, people with mental illness are customers. Uh, families are concerned about how trusts and savings are being held. We have a tremendous job to do in the banking industry. They need us. And that was one of the first things we started working on was putting social workers in banks when we developed the non-traditional social work program. And then we subsequently brought social workers into other areas like entertainment, which is super fun, right? If you can go to Warner Brothers and be a social worker, why not? So uh, we're ex continuing to extend this idea that social workers belong in many 
different places, the field has a potential for opening up whole new areas. So sports and social work has been something that has occurred to us recently. And I'll tell you um, a, a very short story about how we got interested in this. Uh, we had a student here who was finishing her degree, her MSW, and when she finished her degree, she came in to talk with me, and she said, you know, uh, I played, uh, she was a successful uh, college athlete in basketball. And she said, uh, I left the team, I stopped playing basketball because I had such a horrible experience with my coach. And it, it was the technique of the coach. The coach was um, uh, really didn't know how to do team building and so on. So basically the coach not only destroyed her spirit and her resilience and her sense of confidence, he destroyed the team. So she said, but I want to go back now that I have my MSW. I want to go back and work in the sports industry, in basketball, because I know what it's like to have bad coaching, and now I know how to work with a coach and how to work with a team so that people can play better, be more resilient, be more effective. And she said, do you have any ideas where I could go? And... I thought, actually, no, you know, I should, we should, we should know about this. So we've been thinking about that ever since, which is how could we use the talents that you all have in this new setting? How could we open up the field? So um, one of the first things we tried to examine, and there's very little data on this, was the mental health status of student athletes, it, people in the NFL, people in the NBA. What do we know? We know about TBI, we know about concussions, we know about life expectancy, we know about the health side of it. And we know when people get in trouble because that shows up in the paper. But we don't know how people adjust what their experience is. What we've begun to discover is that student athletes and professional athletes alike experience a very high degree of distress. The kinds of problems that they have come from pressures to perform, obviously, but also equally pressures to hide physical injuries and eating disorders that go along with the game. And uh, uh, the kinds of adjustment problems um, that come with kids trying to make choices when they're far from home for the first time. They're exposed to substance use. They're exposed to a lot of pressures that, uh, with no real uh, support for making good choices. Uh, burnout. And... Uh, Depression and anxiety are common. So there was a survey by the NCAA uh, for a year recently. Uh, they discovered that 30% of the athletes they surveyed were depressed, and 50% had persistent high anxiety levels. And we know this is true, by the way, of professional athletes. We don't have to go down the list, but we know about, um, some of you may have read the book that Hall of Famer uh, Jerry West wrote. He was uh, had his whole lifetime career with LA Lakers. Um, and then he became an NBA executive. He wrote a book in which he described a lifetime battle with depression. Um, he called this book West by West a charmed and tormented life. And we know Michael Phelps, who had 28 gold medals, the most celebrated Olympian in history. He suffered from serious depression, arrested twice for DUI since he's uh, uh, stopped swimming. And he's now a mental health advocate. But there was no one there who recognized the kind of issues. So the NCAA now has a best practices guide that it just wrote in 2016 on mental health for student athletes. 
So, so this is starting as a, a separate aspect of what we understand about the field to emerge, uh, to get further recommendation. But more can be done to help, and that's what we're here to talk about tonight. Uh, what we need to do is to give strategies to team members and to their families, not just to them, for coping with all the challenges that they face on the court and off the court, and to fill a gap, because if you think who provides the help right now, it's sports psychologists, it's, ther it's physical therapists, and it's, peop it's uh, physicians who do sports medicine. There is no one who is addressing the whole life of these athletes, their families, the communities in which they live. So we have the answer, we have the perspective, they need us. What could we do? Reduction in domestic violence. This is something we're trained for. Marital instability. Parenting difficulties. Uh, adjustment to separation. Improving coaching practices. I already mentioned that to you. But helping some of these players ad adjust to adult expectations. It's what we think of when people come to college, except a lot of these players come directly into the team. Um, helping, perf helping improve reliability in performance. Showing up on time. Some of the things that we think of as basic adjustment. Helping with life transitions. Who helps players retire? We know how Kobe retired. It took him a year. I thought he did a great job, actually. I thought he, he made his own transition for himself, which was probably one of the hardest things he did in his life. But if you think of all the other players who either have to make that transition because they're forced to do it or because they, it's time, there's no help. Um, dealing with grief and loss and other changes in the organization. So these are illustrations of things that, that we can do better than anyone. And then macro level support for underserved communities, and you're going to hear about our graduates who have done exactly that with the Dodgers. Pretty good stuff. Um, so many of our graduate students, and maybe some of you here tonight, are former athletes. Uh, you have the lived experience of being on a team and coaching and life in the public eye. Uh, but I don't want to kid you. Nobody knows about us. This is not something where you can show up and say, here I am. Uh, I know you were waiting for me. No. Nobody's quite there yet. So we have to demonstrate our value. And tonight, this is your chance to rethink your own skills and how you might be able to take advantage of uh, your talents and training in this area. Because athlete, athletic organizations worldwide need us. You've already been told that our new professional, our career and develop, professional development team, I gotta learn how to say this, it's new. Um, they can provide you with support and tools after we follow, you know, after we have this session uh, to think about yourself, how you might like to position yourself as a job candidate in this area. So I'm just here to say that this school is really committed to development of this new area and to development of you and uh, demonstrating our value to the world. So thanks very much for joining us tonight. It's terrific to see you, and I hope, hope it's really worth your time. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Flynn. Uh, thank you, Dean Flynn, for your innovative leadership and your openness to, again, uh, bringing social workers where no social workers have gone before. Thank you very much. So now want to remind everybody who's watching us for your live stream, uh, you can send your emails to swalumni.usc.edu, and at the conclusion or towards the end of the presentation, we will be uh, fielding those questions um, with our guests. Thank you. So very excited uh, to bring to all of you here today and all of you watching us via live stream 
uh, a national thought leader in this area. Uh, this is thought leader leadership um, that is opening up doors uh, for social workers in these places and with sports teams uh, that may not even really know what social workers do. Um, we know that social workers have, um, there's a certain perception of us, um, and this is what we're here, we're all about, and we're educating uh, different organizations and sports teams on what we can bring to the table. So I wanted to introduce Emmett Gill, PhD, MSW, who's the president of the National Alliance of Social Workers in Sports, um, which we're going to hear more, a little bit more of today and what his organization is doing to open up doors for all of us. He's also the director of student athlete wellness and per personal development, clinical assistant professor at the University of Texas at Austin, and the national coordinator for the Student Athletes Human Rights Project. He has worked at North Carolina Central University, or NCCU, the U.S. Military Academy Center for Enhanced Performance, where he supervised men's and women's basketball student athletes um, in areas such as academic, social, and athletic performance enhancement, as well as at Ruck Rutgers University as an assistant professor and faculty mentor for women's basketball. While at NCCU, he developed the Student Athlete Wellness Center a collaboration between the MSW program and athletic. And his scholarship focuses on the intersection between social work and athletics and scandals in college sports. Please help me in welcoming Emmett Gill. Thank you. If you, if you need it. Do I need to use the mic? We do need to use it for the live, live stream, live stream. Uh, and I'm going to try and do both of these at one time. First of all, I'd like to thank Juan for inviting me. Here. For inviting me today. For inviting me this evening um, here to the Suzanne Dwork Peck School of Social Work. Um, thank you so much to Dean Flynn, you know, for being a visionary in, form, in terms of transformational social work and addressing social work in different ways. Um, so again, I'm going to try and use this microphone because I don't like microphones, but I'm going to try my best to do this. So before I go to this slide, I can't tell y'all how excited I am to be here. Every time I get this opportunity to talk about sports social work, I just get tickled to death. I just get tickled to death. Because, you know, I really can't explain to folks how this is, for, for me, this is a journey of some about 20 years, about 20 years when I first saw a human interest story at the halftime of an NBA game and it talked about, you know, an athlete who's, who, who overcame the substance abuse issues and the, and the, the, the loss of his father to, to become not only a, a, an elite NBA athlete but also a great father and a great husband. And so I just get tickled to death and I'm so tickled that that the room is full and that there are people out there that are watching from afar. This is very exciting to me. So let me go ahead before I begin. I haven't had my coffee, but if I seem a little bit excited, it's just because I'm very passionate about what I do. All right? So let me get started because this is an opportunity to see you. So first I'm going to define and I'm going to talk about what social work is all about and how social workers and social work students can utilize their skills in a variety of ways, some of those which Dean Flynn already mentioned. And then we're going to talk about some potential career options for social workers, not only in professional sports, but in college sports, in secondary sports, in high school and youth sports. Then a couple of strategies for alumni and students who, who might want to pursue a career, what their options are in terms of sports social work. And then lastly, I'm going to tell you about this small but powerful and emerging organization, sort of like, you know, it's sort of like the reemergence of USC football, you know, just on the scene again. We are going to make this thing happen. I'm going to tell you about this little organization called the National Alliance of Social Workers in Sports, where, we, where we're trying to do a lot of great things. So what, what is sports social work? Well, when we talk about sports social work, we're talking about promoting social justice and social change by focusing on the unique needs of athletes, 
not only at an individual, but at an environmental level. Okay? Now, I, I got to make sure that I, I want you to track this. We're not just talking about, you know, the student athlete or the professional athlete, the high school, the youth athlete. We're not only talking about them, but we're talking about the person and the, and the environment. So we're talking about their family. We're talking about their community. We're talking about their sport organization. We're talking about all of those things when we talk about social justice and social change when we talk about sport social work. But not only that, we look to promote the health and well-being of athletes through direct practice, through community organizing, through advoca advocacy, policy development, education, and research. Yes, research. You can actually like research <laughs> if it's related to sports. And we see some of the issues with regard to advocacy now with our professional athletes. Whether you like what Colin Kaepernick is doing or not, you have to appreciate the fact that not only Colin Kaepernick, but the Bennett brothers and others have stepped up and said, you know what? We're going to talk about prison reform. We're going to talk about police-involved shooting. These are the things that we think about and that we wanted to happen in the aftermath of the death of greats like Muhammad Ali. And so these are two aspects of what we call sport social work. And then lastly, back to a direct, direct practice level, we look to enhance the capabilities of athletes to address their own behavioral health and psychosocial needs. One of my greatest supervisors, when I was getting my MSW, said one thing, I need you to focus on this. She said, you know what? If you've got the same 20 or 30 people on your caseload next year that you had on there this year, you're not doing your job. Your job is to move people off of your caseload. And so one of the things that we want to do is we want to enhance the capabilities of athletes, not only athletes, but their families, to address their own, their posse, if you will, to address their own behavioral health and psychosocial needs. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of abbreviated timeline of sports social work. It started with, goes back to that social work history with James Adams and Whole House, <laughs> acculturating immigrants into America, using sports like boxing to capitalize on helping them understand and, and cope and adapt in their transition into the United States. And yes, they were resistant to it, but once they saw the ability of sport to allow them to work with others from different backgrounds, ethnicities, etc., they began to adopt this idea of sport. And then we talk about midnight basketball. Now, y'all, some of y'all probably not in here old enough to remember midnight basketball. But midnight basketball was actually written into the anti-crime bill during the Reagan era. So money was funding midnight basketball. They said, you know what? If people are out playing basketball, they can't be out committing crime. And so then we go from 1986 to Greg Harden. Greg Harden was a student athlete who was recruited at the University of Michigan. He dropped out. He went to work in a rural section of Michigan, and the Mich great Michigan coach, Bo Schembechler, said, you know what? He's doing great things for young people there. I'm going to bring him back to the University of Michigan. And Greg Harden, I consider to be the godfather of social work, sports social work when he started working with the Michigan football team. Let me roll off some of these names for you, okay? <laughs> All right? Desmond Howard said there would be no Heisman Trophy without Greg Harden, okay? Let me roll off another name for the, for the ladies in the room. Tom Brady <laughs> says that Greg Harden is one of the most important voices in his life. So we go from Greg Harden to Kristen Martin who's at the University of Tennessee and has been there working with Team XL as a licensed social worker since 2003. But there's where I, and I had to take a step back, got into <coughs> sports social work when I began to see pro sports and they began to develop these human interest stories and, and talk about not only the negative, but also the positive aspects of sport. University of Michigan School of Social Work started the Sport Social Work Association. 
And then I had an opportunity to start the Student Athlete Wellness Center at North Carolina Central University. And then I met this guy named Matt Moore, a professor at Ball State University. And I met another colleague, Dr. Ginger Gamel, and we started the National Alliance of Social Workers in Sports. A couple of months ago, we had our first peer-reviewed special edition journal that focused on sports social work. Nine peer-reviewed articles, three research notes, two commentaries, all talking about social work and Organizations like the NFL Trust. How many people watch NFL on Sundays? How many people got the ticket? How many people got a favorite game? How many people have a significant other that they're tired of them watching football and talking about fantasy football and wearing jerseys? <laughs> so sports, the NFL is affected just by everybody in this room, right? You feel me? You feel me? The NFL Trust employs six MSWs six MSWs. So sports social work, the timeline is increasing. Let me, let, I focus, my positionality right now is the Director of Student Athlete Wellness and Personal Development at the University of Texas at Austin. And in my capacity, I work with student athletes. So for a minute, just so we can talk a little bit about, you know, piggyback off of Dean Flynn's introduction and, and some things that Juan mentioned, vulnerability. We don't think about, about athletes as being vulnerable. Okay, the pro athletes, we're not thinking about them being vulnerable because you're riding around, you know, you got the big rims, you got the nice rides, you got tennis shoes for days. They're, how could you possibly be vulnerable? But that's what we see out in public. You're a student athlete. You get cost of attendance money. You get a full-time scholarship. You get priority registration. You also, you know, have the opportunity to, to receive a free education. How could you possibly be vulnerable? But what we do know about student athletes is that almost 33% of them demonstrate or have said they demonstrate some type of depressive symptoms. 33% of 450,000 student athletes, that's almost 150,000 student athletes per year, 150,000 student athletes. <coughs> then we have 23%, another study, who said that they meet clinically relevant levels of depressive symptoms, meaning they could be diagnosed with depressive, uh, with a pre depressive mental health disorder. The NCAA found that, and this is an old statistic actually, now it's not 22% of student athletes use marijuana, but it's almost up to 26%. And we know, according to the DSM now, that marijuana is a substance abuse disorder. We know the reasons some of the reasons that young people use marijuana. Suicide, the fourth leading cause of death amongst NCAA student athletes. One of them, one of the most widely known and chronicled cases of suicide came, we've had two this year amongst student athletes. We had one last year, the Ohio State football player that they could not find for about a week. And then we know that 6.6% of our female student athletes showed symptoms of eating disorders. And so when we talk about vulnerabilities, we also have to talk about you know, domestic violence and dating violence amongst NCAA student athletes. How many people have ever heard the case of Yearly Love, the Virginia lacrosse player who died at the hands of her boyfriend who was another student athlete? We have to talk about child sexual abuse. How many people heard about the Jerry Sandusky scandal at Penn State? Okay. Did you know that four social workers met with Sandusky in the years leading up to him being finally arrested and investigated? Four social workers did not step in and intervene because of the allure of Penn State football. So when we talk about vulnerabilities, not only are we talking about the student athlete vulnerabilities, we're talking about males and females. We're talking about the kids who come to sports camps. Not to mention the fact that right now we have 120 student athletes at the University of Texas whose families have been impacted by Hurricane Harvey or Hurricane Irma. And they've got to go onto the field and perform. They have to go to class. And so these student athletes 
are vulnerable. So I, I really want to put you in the mindset that, you know, whether you're a professional athlete and you've got money or you're a student athlete and you're on full ride, there are vulnerabilities there. We've got homeless student athletes now, okay? We've got student athletes who hail from foster care. Has anybody seen the documentary Last Chance You? Anybody see it? Okay. How many people read today the two of the kids that were featured in that documentary charged for homicide in a stabbing? Vulnerabilities. So I hope that I've put you in that space. I hope that you can sort of see how your skill set can help athletes, student athletes, their families, and the communities. Because now I want to talk about some different areas of work. And youth sports is where it happens. Now, Juan was very intentional in the fact that he said, you know what, don't you paint a rosy picture. You know, everybody like, you know, not everybody. People like sports. People want to be involved in sports. I, I, I can't lie, y'all. I like my job. I like to go to University of Texas. I get to roll up in there, you know what I'm saying? I got my burn orange on, you know what I'm saying? I sport my sneakers. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? I know, I know. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? You no, know, I understand. I, I know where I am. I know where, and I know what's gonna happen on Saturday. I, I, I already know. We all gonna have a good time because sports is community building. So we all gonna have a good time. So everybody wants to be a part of that, but the reality is, you gotta start somewhere. You know, and youth sports provides a great opportunity for that. It's not only youth sports for organizations, but now I foresee youth sports and social workers being in place in school social work, okay? Whether you're a school social worker working as a coach or you're a school social worker who takes advantage of being able to interact with your kids on the sports field, there's a place there. AAU. AAU is not just about basketball, but it's also about volleyball and other sports. So there's an opportunity to connect there. But not just that, how many people have been to a sport, youth sport event, or you might be the one, <laughs> you might be the one where you see the parent acting up, you see the parent cutting the food. Now it might be some of y'all, I know it used to be me, until I got together. <laughs> and so there's also an opportunity to work in terms of training parents and coaches with how to act and how to work with young people, just as Dean Flynn mentioned. So there are opportunities there. When we talk about secondary sp school sports, I just want to focus on one thing. It's not just about coaching high school sports and training high school athletes, but now what about working with entire systems? So not just a team or a school, but an entire school district. Now we see social workers working with entire school districts because school districts have athletic departments and athletic directors. So there's great opportunity there. But I have to be honest, many of the opportunities now exist in college sports. With respect to the National Alliance of Social Workers in Sports, we recently had a social worker hired at Louisiana State University, another hired at the University of Georgia, another is a tennis coach, assistant tennis coach at Butler, okay? We know that we already have social workers working at the University of Michigan in athletics, Tennessee, Connecticut, North Carolina Central. Okay, so the opportunities exist there, and I'll tell you why. Because not only do you have an opportunity to go in and do some clinical work, but at the University of Texas, we have three MSWs working on our academic support program. And so not only do you have an opportunity to impact them in terms of their academics, but then you're sitting down. Because remember now, you've got to meet the person in the environment. So in order to help them with their academics, you got to understand that there may be some other things that are going on. So you have opportunities like clinical social work. You have opportunities like academic advisor. You have opportunities like my title, Director of Student Athlete Wellness and Personal Development. So there are a myriad of opportunities that exist on the college level. Now dig this. You don't have to work in athletics to work with athletes on a college level because our social worker with the Alliance who's working at the University of Georgia actually works with a local hospital. The University of Alabama football team alone contracts for social workers outside of athletics. University of Alabama. How many people have been to the University of Alabama? Now, it's nice here. 
And just because I'm talking to all y'all, this is nicer than Alabama. But y'all got to go there and check it out. <laughs> all right, leave it at that. So there are a lot of opportunities. I'm going to hit you with this before I move to pros. The athletic director at the University of Michigan that has one of the largest athletic budgets in the country, the athletic director is an MSW. The former head of the women's professional golf tour was an MSW. The second in charge at the NBA at one time was an MSW. Okay? So the opportunities are limitless. And then we have professional sports. I know I'm talking a lot, and I know that I'm only supposed to be up here 30 minutes, so I'm going to start to move a little bit faster. And what I will say is that one of the things that we have noticed in professional sports is the opportunity for social workers to work in employee assistance programs. One of the members of the National Alliance, Mr. John O'Neill, has worked in Major League Baseball now for over a decade. I explained to you the opportunities with the trust. We have not seen that type of movement in the NBA. But what we do know, what we do know about professional sports, and I want you to hear this, is that if you are a good social worker, a professional team will find you. They will find you. They will fly you in. They will pay you. They will make sure that you protect their investment. Because it happened with one of our members now who works with the Houston Texas. Texans. She did not have her eye on professional sports, but what had happened was <laughs> she was just a good social worker. And so one of the things that I say when talk about career options for social workers in sports is that, you know, if you're a good social worker and you have uh, aspirations to work in sports, be good at your craft. Those teams will find you, especially if you live in the same area. And now we have life after sports. And I think Dean Flynn again alluded to this. Look at the issue with NFL and concussions. Now you have assisted living programs that are being developed specifically for professional athletes. Okay, now dig this, stick with me, track me on this one. You got the concussion settlement, right? So they got money to pay for services, right? They need social workers because concussions bring about dementia, depression, chronic pain, other issues. Social work. <laughs> okay. International, it's just happening. Folks in Canada are doing social work with athletes. I can say I know for sure in Canada. I just put that up there because I know Canada. I don't know too many other places, but I'm sure it's happening. <laughs> uh, I'm keep it real with y'all. <laughs> and then there's research. There's research. You know, the NFL gave uh, the National Institute of Health or the National Institute of Mental Health, $30 million. $30 million to look at research related to concussions and mental health. So not only is there a career option there, but there's an opportunity in terms of research. How am I doing on time? I'm good. Let's get back right, and this is important. And you might say, well, why he got up all them social work terms? Because we're talking about sports and social work. But one of the things that if this is an area that you're interested in that I really want you to know is that it's like any other type of social work that you want to do. Once you hone in on the area that you want to work on, you can be more effective in terms of marketing yourself. And that's so very important. It took me 10 years to really figure out what, I, what my skill set was, what I could do. I can build rapport with athletes. I know how to do programming. I know how to work in and out of systems. I need to be in a mesosystem area in terms of my social work. And you need to do the same. Like I said, it's not just about the microsystem and athletes and coaches and teammates. Maybe that's your thing, and that's great. That's a crowded area. Because you got, as it was alluded to, you got sports psychologists that you have to work with. You have licensed professional counselors who are occupying that space. Not that you can't, but it's crowded. But then when you get up to the mesosystem and the exosystem, especially with regard to the organizational policy piece and the working with other mental health professionals in terms of building the team, it's not as crowded. And that's a great opportunity. You know, everybody's got turf issues. You know, this is my athlete. This is my team. No, you can't work with them. 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 And everybody, you know, fighting over the athlete. But there are certain spaces where if you can work as a team or you're working on policies that are related to the team or related to the sport, then you can be valuable. Remember that time in the Ray Rice incident 
where the NFL put together that team of individuals to address domestic violence. Now, regrettably, I didn't hear about a social worker being in there, but it would have been great. And that's an instance where leagues are moving in that area. When we talk about things like baseball and, and players, and, and James and I talked about this, coming from places like the Dominican Republic and, and trying to get them uh, uh, to adapt to life in the states, that's a place where we can work. And lastly, the macro system. And that's just really, you know, looking at the broader implications of sport. One of the reasons that I really enjoy sports is because the first football game at Rutgers University back in the late 1900s was really designed for one purpose, to bring communities together. And individuals who can work in that macro system and understand the broader sport culture and how sport can be so valuable, whether it's kickball, whether it's adult kickball, whether it's a co-ed league, oh man. That's, what we, that's when we see the intersection between social work, sport, and things like urban planning. Because you're looking at it in the broader context. Spaces for sport, planning for sport, et cetera. So I really want you to think about that. If you're thinking about going into this area, it's not necessarily where you want to be that you might be able to start. You may have to start here to get here. You may have to start here to get there, but you really have to understand it because, you know, as Juan and I discussed, this is a difficult business to get into now. I can't imagine how difficult it is to get in social work and entertainment, but I would think that it's probably equally as difficult as sport is because it is a challenge. You have to understand, not only do you have people who are trying to protect assets, but you've got athletes who are like, what do you really want from me? What do you really want? You know, you've got former athletes who go into the business, you know, and they're still dealing with some of these. So there's a lot going on. So it's a very closed system. You know, I went over to your Department of Athletics here and, and I couldn't get in one door. I'm like, man, y'all ain't even going to let me in. <laughs> What's going on? I'm going to tell you something. At the University of Texas, our volleyball courts are below my office. You know what? To get in there, they have one of the, the hand fingerprint scanners. <laughs> I put my finger up there just to see if I get in. Don't didn't even move. I was like, I'm like, eh, eh, you're not coming in. <laughs> really protected. So you have to have an idea of where you want to go and what you want to do. I'm going to roll through these very quickly. I'm going to put them up there, and I'm going to roll through them so that we can get James up here, and he can tell you all about all the wonderful things that he is doing with the Dodgers. First of all, you got to really – Right now, there is no program where you can go and learn about sports social work, except for one I'll tell you about that later, okay? And I'm hoping that another emerges soon, hint, hint. <laughs> All right, so what you can do is look at the media stories. Media stories are the way that I came into the business. I paid attention to them because, you see, they might do a story on Chris Henry who suffered from depression, ended up jumping out of the back of a vehicle, but then they would go interview social workers about his condition. Pay attention to the credible media stories. Have an enterprise and spirit. You got to get out there. You have to think. No one's going to give you this. It's not going to be like anything you've ever done before. So you're going to have to have an enterprise and spirit. You're going to have to have some creative hustle. You might have to volunteer. Okay? You might have to go through some games. and might not. You might have to go and work in some sports for which you know nothing about and don't really care about. You're going to have to have some creative hustle. It's just like the entertainment industry. To get in the entertainment industry, you got to go out and hang out at parties. And not that that's necessarily a bad thing, <laughs> but it does take a lot of energy and a lot of money. Okay? Volunteer, specialized coursework, self-assessment. And that was a slide that I referred to earlier. Now, this slide is important. Let me speak to the alumni. Alumni, it can't happen. It can't happen. Wherever you're at now, if you want to go into sport, sport social work, it can happen. But you've got one or two ways that you can do it. You can either drop everything you're doing and go volunteer and start reading some media, media stories and enterprise and spirit, or you can think about starting to craft your practice in a way that's attractive to support team, whether it's a private practice and you do direct practice or whether you do some organizational work. It can be done, okay? For students, right now is the time. 
in your classes, whether it's social policy or research or human behavior in the, in, in the environment, whatever it is, whatever papers you have, do them on sports social work. Look and seek out opportunities for field placements. And again, it might not be direct practice. It might be community organizing. It might be organizing leagues. It might be working with coaches. Whatever it is, seek out those opportunities. But here's the thing that's important to both of you. And I, I need you to hear this. I need you to tune in. For all y'all out there who are tuning, tuning in over the webinar, I need y'all to listen to this. This is the thing that I need for you to hear. At every opportunity you have to explain to someone what sports social work is, explain it to them. Okay, I'm a very spiritual man, so I spread the gospel about church, and I'm saying enough about that. I feel the same way about sports social work. Because what it does is it allows you to better understand what it is. It allows you to demonstrate your passion. It allows you to have someone walk up to, me, walk up to someone else and say, you know what somebody else told me the other day? They told me about sports social work. Oh, yeah? <coughs> What's that about? And then they go tell somebody, and they tell somebody, and they tell somebody else. But the more you talk about it, the more people will come at you and say, they're not vulnerable, and then you have reasons why. They'll say, well, they don't need sports social workers there, and then you know and you tell them why, and it helps you. And so one of the things I want to say to you is, anytime you have the opportunity to explain it, explain it. I'm going to go on to the, the last slide before I hit this one. Get in the loop. Get in the loop. I'll put some names up there like Greg Harden, Barbara Hansen. Um, Kristen uh, at the University of Tennessee, Lauren Mordecai at, at, at UConn, get in the loop. Get to know these folks. Get to know the John O'Neills of the world. Be in the loop and be in the know. These are my last two slides. The National Alliance of Social Workers in Sports. We want to promote individual and community well-being through partnerships between, professional, between the profession of social work and the field of athletics. Our vision is to lead to the integration of social work practice into all realms of sport with the goals of individual and community well-being. And we've accomplished, I think, in a lot of ways, our first step, although it's continuing, and that's defining athletes as a vulnerable population who need social workers to engage team, assess plan, and intervene in their lives. I'm going to go through this very quickly, and this really is my last slide. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Z. Founded in 2016, we're just a little bit over a year old, but right now we have 131 members. Y'all, can y'all say that with me? 131 members. I love it. I'm going to tell you why I love it. Because that was about community organization and building. Every time I would meet someone from our organization, you know what they say to me? I didn't know there were people out there who did this. And I said to them, and I say, you know what, I used to think that too. It's like going to Mars and finding life on Mars. I'm serious. We're like, we were just so happy to know one another. And so it's about community building. We will have our third annual sports social work symposium in Dallas, Texas, where we have the chief medical officer from the NCA, Dr. Brian Hayline, coming to speak at our conference. Dean Flynn, you remember she said that the NCA has a mental health toolkit? One of our members helped put together that toolkit. The NCA came to us and asked us to endorse that toolkit. And this is all because of the great work of our 131 members. We have youth, college, and professional sports committees. And in 2018 of January, we will kick off our sports certificate program, online program, wh which will end with a field placement, a virtual field placement, for the people who've gone through the curriculum. Not only that, but we're doing advocacy on the youth, college, and high school level. We've consulted with some of the major conferences and hopefully some professional conferences soon. We're conducting research and applying for grants. And we have a website where we have blogs, job announcements, webinar, and listserv. We have professional membership as well as student membership. So as I close, that was my last slide. I'm done, I promise. But here's what I want to say. I hadn't even had my coffee tonight. So y'all can imagine if I had some coffee, how I come out here. And this is not an act. I love what I do. And what I want to encourage you, whether you're alumni or student, and if you're interested in sport and you're passionate about it, 
Make it happen. Make it pop. I mean, I get up every day, and besides my hour and a half commute to work, which I hear is the norm around here, <laughs> I love my job. I pick up my coffee in the morning around 8.30 or 9 a.m., and by the time I'm finished drinking it at 6, it's time to go home, and the day has flown by because I get to do things like create groups for injured athletes, create a transition program for our athletes, create a substance use prevention program where we have peer educators. I get to work with trainers. I get to work with faculty. I get to work with, with, with sports medicine. I get to work with sports psychologists. I get, I, I get to wear this gear to the game, y'all. <laughs> and although I, it, it, what's going to happen on Saturday is very uncertain, <laughs> very uncertain. I absolutely adore the student athletes that I work with because for real, for real, they got two full-time jobs. And I love their parents because they come from miles around to support them. And I think that what life is all about is that we find our passion and we find what we love to do. And if you actually enjoy sport and you enjoy social work and you enjoy helping people, this is something that you need to check out. And then in a few years, you'll be up here standing all excited and happy about what you do, although I'm sure that you're excited and happy to do the social work that you do. So I want to thank you so much for your attention and your time, and I look forward to hearing James and answering any questions later. Peace. Thank you. So, so Emmett, thank you very much. Um, and we want to grow that membership. We want to grow that membership from 131 members, don't we? Right? So um, we've arranged a special request uh, from the Alliance, if you'd like to share a little bit about it, for all of you who are here today and all of you who are watching us via live stream, a discount on membership. Yes, yes, we're just offering a discount on our, on our membership. Um, I believe we talked about $60 or so for student memberships. For, and For professional. For professional memberships. Um, it'll be even less for student memberships. We just want y'all to get involved. 35, thank you. See, Juan right up here. Man. <laughs> the businessman. <laughs> he coordinated this. But it is a great opportunity because we do, my goal as the founding president of the Alliance is to serve our membership. We just don't want this to be something that you put on your resume. We want to make, have you be a part of the community, have an opportunity to write blogs. You see the job announcements. We want you to apply for them. Even if you haven't got that great experience that, that they, they may want you, we still want you to be in the loop. We want you to have the webinars. We want you to be a part of the listserv. You'll be a part of a community. And the thing that I want to say in closing is that an elite community, an elite community. How many people out here know a sports social worker besides me? Boom, you want to be the next one. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you, Emmett. Um, so, Emmett, what, what do they have to do to be able to claim that uh, discount? Yep, all you have to do. Oh, my bad. Sorry, oh, sorry. sorry, I'm sorry. Um, all you have to do, and I'll leave my information, um, I'll give it to you during the Q&A. You can email me, I'll email you a special code. You can sign up on the website for your membership and then start enjoying the benefits immediately. And it, 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 even if you think it's a little bit too much, we'll put you on a payment plan. We got you. We got you. <laughs> Let's hear it for that passion again. It's all about growing this thing, right? That's what it's all about. So before we get to James, I'm going to mention a couple of other strategies. Um, some of these strategies uh, Emmett's already talked about, so I want to supplement those, especially the Trojan connection, the Trojan network. And then I'm going to talk about three examples of internships that we've had an opportunity, a privilege of developing that focus more on the macro, on the macro aspect of things. So um, we, we're co we'll cover all the different um, aspects of social work. So I'm not going to repeat these. You really have to understand what it is that you want and what you bring to the table. And how do you do that? As social workers, assessment is the cornerstone of our interventions, of everything that we do, correct? If our assessment is wrong, our interventions are going to be incorrect. Interventions in career development refer to your resume, to your cover letter, to your interview answers, right? So in order to be able to break in and to be able to sell yourself, we talk about how this is difficult, right? Because we're going, uh, nobody's really paved the way for us. So People have perceptions of, of social workers. We need to educate, as um, Emmett was saying. And you do that through informational interviews. Uh, what is an informational interview? 
Uh, it's where you are asking the questions and you're reaching out to industry experts, uh, whether it be coaches, for example, whether it be uh, coaches on all different levels, or um, in former, former interns and our alums like, like James, maybe, for example. Um, I'm not putting you on the spot. But you, you have to speak with people to help you learn the ropes and to learn the terminology so that you can speak the language and break through the clutter. Um, you need to link your past experience. I'm very excited to hear James uh, in, in a little bit here because he's going to talk to us how his past experience makes sense. You need to make it make sense to someone else. Uh, network. You want to become that referral and oftentimes uh, say there's a position that's open uh, for you know, athlete advisors, for example. Right? There are certain profiles that they might be looking for, and, and if you don't have a connection with somebody there who can help open that door, they're going to see social work, they'll spend a second on it. And it's not that we are not capable of doing it. Again, we are out to educate and let people know what we can do. Um, if you don't have that personal connection, that network, um, it may be difficult for your resume to turn into an interview. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, build up your experience, volunteering, do whatever you can to be exposed um, to those areas. James will talk a little bit about that as well. Become a thought leader. Write blogs. If you're on LinkedIn, um, you, I'm sure that there's articles, and I've seen them. There's articles and links on the, NA, um, the National Alliance of Sports and Social Workers and Sports website. Retweet those or post them on LinkedIn. Start creating your brand, your image. Um, and I know that Emmett said it's taken him 10 years, but you need to start somewhere so that you become an authority. And you start branding yourself as an authority. And as Emmett was saying, then people will start looking for you. And again, um, it'll make sense. Intern, not just field placements. Um, you can intern, I know, with the Dodgers, um, with different sports teams over the summer. And even if you're an alum, if it's something that you really want to do, there's opportunities for you to engage. Why is that important? Because you will have access to decision makers in these organizations. You'll build those relationships, informational interviews. The next thing you know, when a job comes up, they will at least consider you for an in interview. And then from there, it's going to be your, you know, your responsibility and your task to, to, to move forward. And again, educating others is very, very important. So some things to keep in mind. Um, let me mention the Trojan Network. We talked about the Trojan Network. There's a couple of resources that you can access online. Trojans hiring Trojans. How many of you have heard that of that program? OK, excellent. Um, this is a program where uh, alumni across the world have agreed to provide informational interviews. Right? So you can go in and you would actually do your SC Connect or just do Trojans hiring Trojans, uh, you know, keyword search, and it'll come up. And you'll have an opportunity uh, to be able to learn more and to build that connection um, with those alumni that are in the sports industry. Um, and then, of course, there's a USC Alumni Association groups. Um, there's regional groups. Um, there's different uh, affinity groups besides our Alumni Association. Again, let's think outside of social work. Um, if we're on campus, or even if we're not on campus, let's see, I know that Emmett couldn't get into the athletics department. Um, maybe we, <laughs> maybe it might be a little bit easier to get an informational interview, um, et cetera. It's that passion, it's that desire to learn, and not everybody is asking for these things. Right? And of course, you can reach out to our office and we can help you with that, and we will be providing that information at the end. I want to talk about three internships that had the privilege of, of creating um, in this arena. Um, Emmett has been graceful to allow us to offer this internship. This is an internship that right now a VAC student or virtual academic center student is in right now. And this is more macro. Um, we know uh, the organization, the, uh, the alliance, is about a little over two years old. Uh, one year. So it's, so it's, it's definitely growing. Um, and they need help. And we have... The, the skills to be able to offer that help, right? Those macro skills, the research skills, uh, the ability to create needs assessments, to do surveys, to evaluate, to find out. Um, this is what our intern is doing right now, and our intern is doing really, really well. Incredible. Incredible. He's doing an incredible job. Mm -hmm. Leave a shout out to Tamika. Tamika's doing an awesome job. It's, uh, he just gave a shout out to Tamika because we you know. <laughs> <laughs> 
you gotta trust me on that one. Uh, um, also membership engagement, 131 members, um, which is gonna grow after today, I'm sure. Um, but we have that opportunity to be able to engage and build those relationships and create increased membership bases. So that's what our intern is doing right now. We also have an internship that just started uh, this fall with the athletics department and the community outreach uh, realm uh, where they're using our intern, uh, the skills that our intern is bringing to engage student athletes um, in this first bullet um, in programs that already exist. So they already have programs where they're teaming up athletes with local mil um, elementary schools, middle schools, et cetera. So our intern is going to be working on supplementing those efforts um, there's other programs where they're also teaming up. Uh, there's girl, a program called Girls Play, um, where um, the athletic teams are working with, uh, with young women on empowering and, and helping build self-esteem, et cetera. And what's also really interesting, uh, when we're talking about the connection of social work, um, this is an, an initiative where they're gonna be teaming uh, or putting teams together with causes. And if you look at some of these causes up here, Sound like social work, right? The elderly, veterans, um, homeless individuals, anti-bullying, domestic violence, these are all arenas where we are thought experts ourselves, right? So they're gonna, that intern is gonna be working on work, building up those teams and those, identifying those different, um, working with the, the athletes um, and those teams and being able to supplement those efforts as well. Again, these are not one-on-one, -on -one, these are a little bit more macro, so I wanna supplement um, that, and let you know that there are a variety of different opportunities up there as your diagram was showing up there, Emmett. And then the third one I want to talk about, have the privilege of working with the Los Angeles Dodgers Foundation uh, in developing this internship in this major league initiative that's in all 32 teams where it's the reviving baseball in inner cities. It's using that RBI, that baseball term, to engage 5 to 18-year-old uh, young people um, in utilizing baseball as a pro-social activity. And right now, this was our very first intern, and I'm gonna introduce James in a minute here so he can tell you a little bit more about this, uh, this great internship. Um, and we also are excited because we have another intern who's currently working and I believe is also doing a great job in corporate sponsor sponsorship. So think outside the box. There are a lot of opportunities. And if you think about it, even if you're not working directly, you are providing and, and supporting the services that are bringing forth the mission of social work in all of these different organizations. So before bringing James up, I want to tell you a little bit about James. All right. So James Lo Lopez, um, shortly after earning his MSW from our school um, in 2016, um, he accepted a position as the Dodgers RBI analyst. As an analyst, is that a social work term? Can be, not all the time, right? Yeah, not all the time, now it is. So it's good stuff. At the Los Angeles Dodgers Foundation, um, which was his second year MSW placement um, when it was COPA, Community Organization Planning and Administration, concentration. Um, at the Dodgers Foundation, his main duty is to develop a robust program measurement and evaluation strategy. For the Dodgers RBI program that currently serves 7,800 youth in Los Angeles. He also works on developing grants, event planning, community engagement, and fundraising. Before begin, be, be, beginning his MSW program, James worked as a recreation and sports coordinator for a foster youth group home. The connection. From boys, for boys and implemented new recreational programming which included inter-facility sports leagues. And he, he received his Bachelor of Arts in Sociology with a minor in Education from UC Santa Barbara in 2009. Let's welcome James Lopez. Thanks, Juan. Um, allow me one minute to um, give honor and thanks to, to those who deserve it. Um, first and foremost, my, my wife is here supporting me. Um, she's also a social worker. Um, I graduated this program. Um, thank you, Juan and Dean Flynn, for um, having me here. Um, you know, without your leadership, uh, this would have never happened for me and pioneering these new avenues for social workers to, to go down. And um, in addition 
I call him Coach Bush, but Dr. Bush in the back, he, he's a mentor of mine, and he walked me through um, my internship. So, uh, and, uh, and, and lastly, uh, my colleague Tiffany Rubin, who's here to support, she's uh, our Dodgers RBI manager for the, um, for the program we're going to talk about. Um, so I just wanted to stop and say, and say thanks and, and, um, and give honor what honors due because, um, because I, I can't talk about everything that I do um, without recognizing those who've helped me along the way. But um, my main goal and my thoughts that I want to share with you um, are to give you a sort of real life of example of everything we've talked about so far, talking about those macro and meso social work skills um, that, that we all use in our everyday in our everyday jobs as social workers or, um, or that we interact with, if you're more direct practice, you interact with um, other social workers who do this, um, kind of show you and highlight the skills and the competencies that, um, that I've used in, in, in an environment that focuses on developing um, youth and youth sports um, specifically. Um, so overall, if you look at in my past, sports has always been um, a part of my development a part of who I am. Um, it's, I grew up playing sports. I did martial arts, football, baseball. Um, focused on football in high school because they cut me for baseball. But um, look at me now. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, and um, I, I, I just think, like, do I have, did, is there a lot of people who played sports here? Yeah. Um, I think we all, we all know um, and we could probably point to some experiences where um, s something you learned on the field or on the court um, kind of shaped who you are and kind of taught you about life or taught you about how to relate to others or some um, emotional maturity maybe. Um, and, and that's why that's why I care about what I do. Um, and, and I think that we, we would all attest to that. Um, so... In, in my undergrad at UCSB, I worked as a sports coordinator um, for the recreational program there for sports clubs. So I coordinated leagues um, and kind of um, intuitively gravitated sports to, to sports positions because I always cared about it. So I helped them run leagues, um, you know, uh, coordinate referees, um, and providing an opportunity for people who are in school to have a recreational sports experience. I think Emmett mentioned um, in those recreational spaces, uh, it, where we see how communities rally around sport and how much um, recreation in sport can be a huge, um, a huge tool that helps uh, someone kind of deal with the stresses of life, full-time students. But I go out and play basketball for 60 minutes and I'm feeling better, I'm feeling focused for my you know, final exam the next day. So I c in that experience, I saw the power of sports participation for groups and communities and individuals. Um, and then, you know, flash forward a few years later, I graduated from Santa Barbara, and I'm uh, working as a recreation coordinator at um, a group home for boys. And that was my first exposure to the profession of social work. So there, um, you know, I really got to know the clients I served, got to hear their stories, and I knew I need to be in this field. I'm passionate about serving these young people, hearing, hearing about their stories and helping them navigate as they transition into adulthood. Um, and so I worked at, at fir f firstly I worked there as a um, direct care staff and then I moved out to be the recreation coordinator and so again I'm, I'm seeing sports as a prevention or intervention tool uh, part of the whole treatment plan for someone who who's experienced um, a lot a lot of um, detrimental things that were out of their control and it affected their development right um, so and then, so I knew I wanted to be in social work, and then I came here full time. So I couldn't work at the group anymore because I was here full time. And then uh, I, during my second year of, of studies here, I, you know, this internship uh, was available, and um, I went for it. I, d I did not want, I didn't think sports and social work um, was an option for me. I didn't. I, I, I was going to work in direct practice, study, you know, the mental health concentration, uh, work with um, work with transition age youth, which I was passionate about, and particularly um, foster care and, and and probation youth. And I was just gonna go to work and be 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 that kind of social worker. But um, 
some professors pointed me in the direction because they knew me. They know I talk about sports way too much in class. And I was always wearing like Dodgers gear in class. Um, they're like, hey, you know about the internship, right? And I was like, yeah, you know, I, I'm going to interview, but, you know, we'll see. And so they, um, Juan helped me and some others you know, pushed me. And, and I ended up getting the position. Um, and I kind of had this aha moment um, where I was in the interview for that position, a group interview. There were six of us being interviewed by the executive director of the Los Angeles Dodgers Foundation and the Dodgers RBI manager at the time. And I was nervous. I'm at Dodger Stadium. Um, I'm in the Jackie Robinson conference room. Um, Jackie's like looking at me from across the way. <laughs> and he's like, and he's like, don't blow it. Um, but um, uh, one of the questions that was asked was, was about how, how would you, it was a scenario question, and we're talking about a youth baseball program. How would you know if our program is having an effect in the community? How would you know that, how would you go about finding out um, you know, that the community appreciates this, or this is even what they want. And I was thinking, and it just came to me, I've done this before. I've done this before. Because as the recreation coordinator at the group home, I used to have these meetings with, with, the, with the young men we serve. I bring them in and say, okay, hey, what do you guys want to do for recreation? What are you guys passionate about learning? Some kids talk about guitar classes. Some kids talk about weightlifting. Some kids just talk about basketball. Um, some kids want to go to Six Flags every day. But it's like, I, it occurred to me, I've done this. And it's called a focus group. And it's called a community assessment. And it's, it's, it's outreach and engagement with vulnerable populations. And I talked about that. And in that moment, um, I gained confidence. And I knew that I had the skill set. I had the skill set. So what I do day to day now is I'm the analyst for Dodge RBI program. So Dodge RBI is a youth baseball and softball program, reviving baseball in inner cities. Um, it's been in Los Angeles since 1989, I believe, but in the last four years, the Dodgers Foundation um, and Major League Baseball pushed the Dodgers to kind of take the program. And so our vision um, as an organization is to, is to use baseball and softball as a you know, positive engagement tool to deliver free health and education services to an underserved population in the inner city. So if you're a kid in our program, um, you play ball, you get all the life lessons that, that baseball will teach you, you, you make friends, you, you develop strong adult relationships with your coach and the volunteers in your program, but uh, we're going to come to your community and we're going to bring you um, uh, financial literacy classes, uh, we're going to bring you a health screening, we're going to bring you um, a college tour, a college access program, and at no extra cost. We just know that the power of our brand and the power of the sport in general, the community already rallies around sports participation. You know, we, when, when parents come to a game and auntie and uncle come to the game and grandma and grandpa come to the game, you, we talked about sports as a com bringing communities together. But now that we're all together, let's do something with it. Let's make sure that, that these people we're serving are accessing much more than the sport. So that's our vision. And my job is to measure that. Are we doing OK? Is it working? Um, it, uh, is, it, is it just a bunch of kids with Dodger jerseys running around and, and that's it? No, we, we've identified um, some character attributes that we measure and, and it's not some crazy um, out of this world measurement strategy. We do pre and post surveys with the kids. We do focus groups, we do field interviews. This is stuff we do all the time as social workers, but it's just in a place where the, the, the skill set wasn't there. And, and, or maybe it was there, but didn't have the social work perspective. It didn't account for the person and environment. It didn't account for um, the, com the, the priorities of the community members in the inner city where we serve, which might be different than a little league in, you know, east of here in, in you know, Walnut or something where I grew up. Like, the different needs, right? So, as a social worker, able to bring that to the organization and put a magnifying glass on the value of that to show, to be able to inform practice of the organization and show everybody, look, these are my skill sets. This is how we can apply it, community engagement. And like we said earlier, it's all about assessing, intervening, and um, assessing, intervening, and evaluating, right? So that's what I do day to day. I assess our program, we evaluate it, and then I produce reports 
that influence decision makers, not only our foundation, but all the binds we have from Dodgers ownership and from Major League Baseball, we're influencing their decision making by what we're doing on the ground here in Los Angeles. So I hope that highlights kind of these basic social work skills that you're practicing um, every day in your position or maybe in school and how you can really plug them in and, and it's not a stretch, you know, it's not, it's not, um, it's a good fit. It's not a square peg in a round hole. You know what I mean? And so have confidence, build up your skill set, build your brand, and um, you know you, you can do it too. And I guess we'll uh, go to question and answer now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Have a seat, please. Emma, would you like to have a seat for a Q and A? Um, so actually, I want to also ask um, our. We also have some questions from our live stream audience that we can identify as well. All right, so who has some questions here? And you're gonna, I'm gonna ask you to speak into the microphone. Hi. Hi. Um, so I love sports. Um, Yankee and USC are my teams. But I, and I think everyone in this room understands why we should be in this field because we love social work and that's why we're here. But what is the perception of social workers in these fields? Are these teams, are these organizations looking at social workers thinking, yeah, you could, we could maybe use you or, you know, I feel like sometimes out in, in the real world, people think social workers are people who take away people's kids, right? And we know that's not true. How do we move past that barrier? Um, I can speak to my experience. Um, you know, no one no one speaks the same language that social workers do in my work environment. Um, so now we got two, but we have two social workers in the workspace now. So that's beginning to change. But um, you just have to have confidence in your skill set and let the I, I believe let the work kind of speak for itself. When people see um, what you bring to the table and um, the way you you envision. Uh, communities and individuals, um, then you can open up doors for conversation about it. But um, I think your 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 uh, your question or your intuition about that that bias is real. It's real, and um, and I and I think Emmett could probably comment that like in in practice, you know, the sports psychologist or you know the the professional counselor, people have a tunnel vision on those as like the only people that could that could serve the population. But I think it's on us to, to educate, like we talked about earlier, and create the opportunities to talk about those things. You, you know I gotta come up here and fist bump you on that question. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's real talk right there. And and, and, and James here right on the head, not, you know, what I'll add is that, you know, say you got 10 people in your organization, say you got 10 people in your organization, one or two might know the value and the other sort of looking at you like your dog do when you don't feed, like, you know, what are you going to do? <laughs> but if you're persistent and you're consistent about what you do and, and you, you continue to at least let them know that you're available, you let them know, the athletes, the coaches, the community, they slowly come around. They slowly. And that's what I've seen in my work at, at the University of Texas where, you know, we went from, who are those people down there to working with our fourth ranked women's basketball team for the entire summer? So you're absolutely right. And I think the thing about it is, and it's something that that James alluded to, is you have to know your skill set and trust your skill set and know that, you know, everybody has something. So whether it's a clinically diagnosed issue or it's just homesickness, you have a role there in that space. Other questions? We got a question over here. Thanks again for the both of you for being here. James, of course. I talked to you earlier. That's my man. Dr. Gill, um, just knowing that you, I, I've studied your bio, looked at your bio, and you've been on a few different types of campuses predominantly white institutions and historic black institutions. What have you noticed in terms of athlete needs and the 
discrepancies or what they go through, and also how administration or athletic departments kind of um, streamline their resources to to gear or to curtail certain issues that student athletes face. For instance, you're at UT right now, that's a huge budget versus being at North Carolina Central. So me personally, I've been to two different, I've been to a historic black school and a historic or predominantly white school. And I can definitely, I noticed the difference being a student athlete. And I was wondering if you can speak on any difference that you've seen in terms of addressing student athlete issues. Smart people here. Smart, smart people. Um, no, that's a great question. So, and I hope I can cover it adequately and, and concisely. I think the issues are the same. You know, you see the same issues, but the source of those issues are oftentimes different. At HBCU, you see kids are smoking weed because that's what my mom and my daddy and my brother and everybody in the crib did. You know, it's not anything, you know, I don't have a certain feeling. I don't feel a certain way. That's just what, what we did. Um, I think at HBCUs you see a little bit more trauma. You know, you see kids who have, you know, buried friends, um, seeing friends, you know, perish in front of them. Um, you've seen them with a serious history of domestic violence in their family. So you see that a little bit more often um, than you see at the, the predominantly white schools. At the predominantly white schools, you see some of the same issues, but you know, for some, for one reason or another, some of those student athletes, because they're a little bit more high, high profile, they've had the mentor step up. Um, they've had some type of services provided for them, and so they've had they've had more opportunity to have those issues um, addressed. With regard to the, the the environment at a HBCU, and I'm going to say this, and this is a great point. If you're interested in getting a, in college athletics as a social worker, go to an HBCU. You're going you will be highly valued. You will get great training. It's like working in a you know old school general hospital, you know, and, and you're a doctor or a nurse. You know what I'm saying? How many people in here old enough to remember ER? You know, you, go, you that's where you're going to go train. You know what I'm saying? You're gonna you're gonna you're gonna do those things, and so you're highly valued because you're you're at a low resource institution, not only by athletic department by faculty, because it's a smaller community. And you have to think about social work and sports. And James mentioned this. You know, when you're in the RBI program, you're not just working with those kids; you're working with the whole community. And so it's the same thing at a HBO, HBCU, as opposed to a predominantly white college. It's a little bit larger. You know, the resources are there, and, and you've got, you know, you got the sports psychologist. And the thing about, and I'll say this and I'll, I'll shut up, is when you go to an HBCU and you say social worker, them kids are like, yep, I know what that is. Mm -hmm. I know exactly what that is. Mm -hmm. And most of the time you go to a predominantly white college, it's interesting because in some of the rural sports, like, you know, I used to work lacrosse. You know, them lacrosse players and white boys, you know what a social worker is? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Golf, you know what a social worker is? That's somebody who socially work. Mm, no, that's, that's not it, son. That's not it. So, so you know, it's a little bit more familiarity with it with regard to HBCUs. But that that's a great question. That's a great question. Another question. Question in the back. Uh, so my ultimate goal is to ultimately create my own nonprofit for um, youth who are attending high school and junior high um, to prepare them to play collegiate sports and um, prepare them mentally and also physically. Uh, so I was wondering if you all are aware of any type of uh, funding that is available for something like that. There's um. There is there's always funding. Um, it's just a matter of you know de delineating what your program goals are, 
or what your organizational goals are and um, finding the right funder. I, um, you know, if, if, it, if it's more towards, um, you know, developing the whole person, then there's a lot of private foundations um, that, that, would, that would get behind you. Uh, and there's, there's, I mean, there's so many, so many uh, private and public foundations that would fund programs like this whether it's after school based or if it is, is it, is it camp based and you know um, you know as you develop your idea and you develop your program um, there is funding and it's and you just have to be able to communicate the impact you're having on the individuals you serve um, and have something hard that they can hold on to um, as a funder you want to be able to say we fund we fund because uh, at the Dodgers Foundation a part of our program is we do charitable giving and we do small grants to different nonprofits, and some of them are even sports-based. Um, and I, I dabble in that work and kind of learn about that a lot. And um, it's the funder wants to be able to put their finger on the head and say, we're funding um, this program because it impacts uh, youth and gets them to college ethics. And they've had a 65% uh, success rate. You know what I mean? Um, so it's it's just a matter of finding the right funder and having having a good program. Um, I don't know a lot about starting up, or f you know, organizationally from you know developing boards and all that, but um, people want to see results. So James, kind of piggybacking on that, would you say that there are foundations that would fund a startup in this arena, or do they need a proven track record? Uh, in the world, uh, there, I mean, in the world of uh, nonprofits and foundations, I was just at a nonprofit conference today, and and the the operational unrestricted support is becoming more and more common amongst foundations that will fund programs. I think um, it's kind of this gray area. We have to f form a relationship with the funder and and um, you know get them to to trust you with their money, but. Um, the, the general operating support is, is there, I'd say. Um, but I, I, I think it's about like forming that relationship with the funder. You know. Yeah, so probably especially if, if there isn't a track record. Correct, yeah. It's um, building that relationship. Um, for people who want to look into getting funding, what would be a first step? Do you just do a Google search? Or how do you identify what types of foundations might be in line with what you're trying to accomplish? Um, I would find a similar program to what you, you what you're doing and see who funds them um, you know see who's funding sports programs who's funding youth development programs um, and and then get on that informational interview with their executive director their uh, d development officer and and kind of pick their brain about um, that would be my first step excellent. and Google helps too excellent yeah. now, lead with the social work don't lead with the sports. Lead with self-esteem. Lead with developing different areas of identity and ability. Lead with the population, whether it's a foster care population, a single parent, first generation. Lead with that and then sneak in the sports part. Because if you go to Google right now and look up foundations that fund sports, you're not going to find a lot. But will you find a lot that want to uh, build certain capacities with young men and young women? Yeah, youth development, yeah, you're going to find all those. So lead with the social work, sneak in the sports, mm -hmm. and, and all those things that, that James had, had, had alluded to. Excellent. Another question. It's, I think you might have just, should I? How important do you think it is depending on the, one's goal, the team that you're interested in? Or do you think it's important to... Um, kind of have a variety of sports you're interested in because I know you said you did lacrosse and then basketball and so um, just because you know I'm sure a lot of us in here are former athletes and um, we may not be specifically interested in that specific sport anymore but we are interested in being involved with athletes from, a, from, from working with them or foundation building a program which realm uh, working with them get in where you can get in you know Get, get in where you can get in, um, you know, in particular, you know, if you have opportunities in high school and youth sports. You know, it's sort of like if you do good work, people are going going to see you. Um, 
you know, if you have opportunities in a sport that's not yours, you know, like I have a friend now, he's teaching tennis and doesn't know anything about tennis. You know, now he got to go out and learn tennis because I thought the objective of tennis was to hit the ball over the fence. That's what I thought it was, James. I thought you hit the ball over the fence and you get some points. <laughs> right. But, you know, learn it because, you know, at the end of the day, you know, that's giving you an opportunity to grow with that young person. And then you can go elsewhere and, and, and sort of specialize in the area you specialize in. Yeah, I think that's I think that's totally correct. You know, baseball wasn't my first passion, um, but I I was always a football guy. But um, I just uh, you got to get in where you can get in, and then um, you know, f like focus on the skills and, and perfect your craft. And you could always, if if you're interested in working directly with athletes, I think you could always go to a, a coach's clinic. You could always get better at learning the sport. You know, you could always learn the ins and outs and the fundamentals. I, I, as part of our RBI program, we do coaches' trainings. I could tell you, I can really tell you how to run the bases, hit the ball, pitch, and I never had success at, at it. You know what I mean? So, like, you can learn the, I feel like you can learn those things if you want to go into different sports. That's great. Another question. First and foremost, thank you both for your time here today. Uh, I'd like to ask. How, uh, if without self-disclosing, how are the salaries for being a sports social worker? <laughs> I'll hit you on that one. <laughs> uh, I'm not, I don't know what James, you know, I'm sure the Dodgers is big time, so I'm not, I'm not sure. I'll say this, you know, starting salary, the University of Utah hired for a position called a student athlete advocate. Did not work in athletics, but it worked with student athletes. It worked at out of out of student affairs. Starting salary was eighty thousand dollars a year. And you're not gonna find a whole lot of social work jobs that pay eighty thousand dollars out of the gate. So that's 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 the example that I provide. Self disclosure, I gotta pay fifty dollars worth of gas every time I'm going up I thirty five. <laughs> so, you know, it's it's been good. And, and their intent, you know, there are other things that you know the other things you get. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I don't mean to, but yeah, it, it's 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 good, especially if you want to get your hustle on and and sort of utilize the brand of the sport organizations you're working with. Then you can bring additional opportunities. Yeah, one thing I learned while I was here as part of the non-traditional social work uh, program is that um, you know I, I I accepted an offer that was uh, a little better than most of my peers did. Um, because of the space I'm in. And being part of such a big, powerful brand, the networking opportunities, the the ability to, to be the Dodger guy that people know and to meet people. And um, I get to go to, like, all the games. You know what I mean? And, and, um, and use Dodger assets to help grow our program, like give tickets to the community. You know what I mean? So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of benefits beyond salary that I'm taking advantage of right now. Thank you. Another question up here. Hi. So in regards to the research area and how to get involved in doing the analysts and all of that stuff, uh, do you guys know what's going on in California or near USC in regards to that? Or do we only have psychologists with the athletes what where do you, what do you guys know oh. right now in in terms of the research in, in the space that I work in in college athletics there, there are lots of opportunities um, you know there's grant funding because you understand there's a lot of opportunities to research college students so the way that you go about it is you say, you know, I've got a subpopulation of college students that I want to look at, and they just so happen to be, you know, college athletes. You know, so if I were looking at opportunities around campus at USC or UC Santa Barbara, University of Texas, you know, I would look for researchers who are working on research with college students, college students in drinking, college students in domestic violence. Also, and I, I want to point this out, also the positive aspects of sport, college students and leadership, college sport, uh, college uh, students and you know decision making you know those positive attributes 
um, I would look in those areas. But let me say this, and, and, I, and I mean this, and I really mean this. We have to have more MSWs that are doing research. And MSWs have the uncanny ability, and I, I don't know too many other places and spaces where research is taught something that's called single subject research designs, SSRDs, an uh, N of one. You know, so if you're volunteering working with an athlete and you've identified some outcomes and you've got that N of one and you've got those writing skills, that's research that can be published. <coughs> Make no mistake about it. It might not go in the top flight journal, but it's research and it's research that will contribute to the field. So it doesn't necessarily have to be fundable research. It can also be single subject research designs um, on a particular issue with a particular population. I hope I answer. I hope I, okay. Okay. Another question? Hello. Um, when getting started to look for these jobs, who would you go to talk to, especially since it's outside of the athletic department? I mean, I, th I think, um, you know, while I was talking about informational interviews, you, you kind of have to do some research and see what systems you want to work in and see who who's doing something similar to what you're doing or making decisions about the work that you would like to do. In the professional sports environment, you've got um, – You've got community relations departments um, that you know are probably an email away, or a number of e bugging emails away. Um, e uh, community relations and team foundations—they um, all have their own staff. Um, you know, uh, the s professional sports teams are there's so many different divisions and departments. So I, you know community relations, foundations, learning, and then professional athletes, all, a lot of them have their own foundations or their own causes that they're, that they're um, passionate about and just kind of taking the temperature on what sports organizations and athletes are passionate about. Is it bullying? Um, is it obesity? Is it domestic violence? Is it, um, you know, whatever the, whatever the issue may be? And then starting, maybe also starting with um, some leaders in, in not necessarily the sports side of that, but in the in the organizations that are tackling those issues. And they, who knows, they might even have like collaborations with, with sports entities that you might, might not even think of. Uh, what about law? <laughs> um, and, and I echo what James said. You know, in college sports, you're going to see academic services. You're going to see student athlete services. You're going to have to, you know, make those calls. Um, I'll say this, I'll say another thing, and this is something that I say to the students that I work with. You know, email is great, but so is a phone call. I don't know how many of y'all old enough to remember the, the telephone commercial that say, reach out and touch someone. It used to be the phone. You know, we don't even have pay phones no more. So, <laughs> so I mean, really, make, make a phone call. Um, go to a sporting event. Um, but it's, it's going to take, you know, a few emails. Um, I tend to, to answer mine just because I really appreciate it when people sort of reach out on social work and sports, but that's it's identifying that person, it's getting that informational interview. You have to show up, you know, talk to them on the phone. Those those things, you know, work. I have a coworker. Um, uh, he's a part-time intern at our, at our organization, and he came to a game. I think he snuck into a game, <laughs> but um, and he would just ask people on staff, "Hey, what do you do here?" Like. Uh, what do you do here? Do you have an internship in your department? I'd like to learn more about that. And that's how we heard about our internship program and, and ended up, he's been with us like three summers now. And she's, my manager's laughing because it's true. <laughs> he, he just, <laughs> he won't go away. <laughs> Another question. Right here. Uh, full disclosure. Uh, I've never studied social work. I actually graduated with a degree in television production. Uh, so as an outsider perspective, athletes are taught so much one sport, focus, focus, focus. Can social work be seen as a distraction? And two, as a fan of a program or a fan of a team, okay, you have a social worker. Why should I be enthusiastic about that? 
do we win the Super Bowl? Do we win the World Series? Like, what's the end goal of your program, and how does that help the athlete? I appreciate that question. Uh, that is a great question. And, and one of the things that I say to our coaches all the time is if, if we win off the field, we're going to win on the field. You know, everybody's got something. And it, again, it doesn't have to be a clinically diagnosed mental health disorder, substance abuse disorder. You know, you don't have to be, you know, stopping that stoplight, falling asleep like Tiger Woods. <laughs> I love Tiger, though. Tiger, my man. But you, you really want to preach if they have clear head, clear mind, they learn techniques like mindfulness or, you know, they're, they're, they're taking care of themselves and, and, and not abusing their bodies and they're in tune with their family or their spirituality. They're taking care of all the dimensions, the biological, the psychological, the social, the spiritual. If they're taking care of all those dimensions, then they're going to perform well on the field. See, that thing the athletes say where they say, you know what, uh, I got all these problems going on, but when I get on the field, it's my haven. That's not true. Well, for some it might be. But for real, those things impact you. And so one of the things we try and sell to coaches and to athletes is if we can get them succeeding in the classroom and succeeding socially, then they're going to do better. They're going to they're gonna perform better for you on the field, and they're going to develop areas of identity and ability that they haven't, that are underdeveloped. And, and that's really what we try and sell. I mean, we try and sell that if you take care of your mental health, the way you take care of your physical health, oh, you're going to be the bomb. And some people buy into that. Yeah, I had the pleasure last year of meeting um, Chan Ho Park, who was like the first uh, Korean pitcher. Uh, he played for the Dodgers, and um, he does a lot of work now with current athletes and teaching them um, mindfulness and teaching them as a pitcher. And he's actually a really, really great golfer, but he he, he teaches athletes um, different techniques, some of some which um, overlap with social work, how to just throw one pitch, you know, or make one swing. And if, you, if you're taking care of all the areas of your life, that sounds a lot easier to just do one thing, do your job on the field. Um, but a, as, a, as, a, as a team foundation, uh, we see value in having an impact off the field. Uh, you know, we're privileged to have a winning team, a team that people like, a team that dominates, you know, the Los Angeles market. Um, but so what if you can't contribute to your local community? Right. Um, if you can't bring others around you, bring them up along the way. And I think there's a huge, huge value. And it's more than just the pretty picture on the L.A. Times of a kid shaking hand with Yasiel Puig. Um, we're doing real work that's going to impact communities. And I think that's a trend of a lot of professional sports uh, franchises. They want to make real, real impact. Thank you. Question? Um, I know you guys have been uh, touching on this a little bit, but I'm also new to the social work profession. My background has been primarily in psychology, and I thought of social workers as the baby snatchers until about a year ago. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm learning in my classes, like, there's so many different realms that social workers can work in. So how do we go about, as emerging social workers or people who have already graduated from the program, how do we go about, um, in sports specifically, um, explaining or showing the difference between the sports psychologist and then what we do. <laughs> uh, I, I think it's what James has alluded to several times, Juan, Dean Flynn. It's the person in the environment. You know, that's really where you separate yourself from the sports psychologist. And, you know, I have a lot of respect for what they do. I work with a couple. Um, but it's dealing with the person in the environment. Not when we talk about the environment, we're talking about the community, we're talking about past trauma, we're talking about the generational issues, we're talking about the family. The other way that I try and differ, uh, distinguish sports social work from sports psychology is, you know, the reality is, is that you're telling me that this athlete is coming to the university and they used to be in foster care and now they're going to lose all of those services or they were in a mental health system, they were receiving some type of therapy, and they're going to lose all those services. So we're familiar with helping them making that transition and dealing with public systems. 
You see, when a sports psychologist goes in and this student athlete got in trouble for a DUI, okay, they might be able to deal with some of the substance use issues, but they not have no idea to help that student athlete navigate that criminal justice system. Or if I got, you know, child support office coming on campus, because one of our student athletes hadn't paid his child support, what's sports psychologist gonna do? They don't do nothing. They don't know nothing about no child support. They don't know nothing about no baby daddy syndrome. They don't know nothing about all that. <laughs> but we do. And so we try and make those fine distinctions moving from, you know, the person to, to the overall environment and the public systems that we must interact with when we have student athletes. And that's and professional athletes as well. No, that's it. And and that applying that person environment perspective to programming. You know, in, in my environment, uh, a lot of people doing community programs just focus on the baseball aspect. How can you get kids playing baseball? Let's teach them how to throw. Let's teach them how to hit. Let's make sure they can um, play in high school and get a scholarship and do their thing or get drafted. Um, in, in Major League Baseball, we celebrate draft picks like crazy. When a kid gets drafted, it's like it's a lot of programs will put them on the front page and, and put them on their social media and stuff. But when we're, we we want to design programs that not just serve the one one need or one goal of that individual. We sure, we wanted in our program in RBI. Not that many of our of our um, young athletes are going to make it to a college scholarship or a um, or a big league contract. But if we can equip them with more skills, more equitable access to education and health resources then we're doing something significant. And who can assess the community better and design these programs than a social worker, you know, in an environment where you're surrounded by former athletes and, and, and individuals who just, that's just not their bread and butter. It just isn't, and we have the training to really make an impact in that area. So on that note, let's please thank Emmett and James. <laughs> Emmett and James. Hey, I just want to say, I'm just so happy to be up here with this Dodger guy. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because I worked in an RBI program, and I know what it takes. I worked in East Harlem RBI, and this guy, he's on the next level of what's being done. Because you got to understand the nonprofit work, the nonprofit development, the, the, the measurement, the focus, all this stuff. This is next level stuff. So I'm, I'm just very proud of, of what you're doing, James, because he has – he has infiltrated another area of sports social work like we've never seen. I'm hoping I'm putting it down in public. I hope he joined the alliance because we need him to, to teach folks about what he's doing and the way he's doing it. I'm just proud to be up here with you, brother. Thank you. We also thank you very much. Um, we also want to thank Dean Flynn um, for her innovation and for her inter introductory remarks, um, letting us know um, how exciting and how excited she is to take our school um, and focus a little bit more in that area, and she believes in that area. So a couple of things. Um, a reminder, how many of you are going to join the National Alliance for Social Workers and Sports? All right, if we want that discount, okay, we have to. Okay, so you can go ahead and email. You can email the SWA alumni at usc.edu, and I'll forward it to, I'll forward it to Emmett. As well, as well, um, and also uh, James, if, if we want to reach out, um, are you okay being if they reach out to our email? Then um, we we can connect you to James, you know as well. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Thanks for that discount, um, Emmett. <laughs> as well, no pressure, you know. No. Um, so to access the recording, all of you should have received an email um, that had the uh, l link to the live stream today, that will be archived in the next few days, and it, that'll become the recording that you can actually still access as well. Um, how many of you are getting CEUs? Um, so we're offering CEUs for people who are present here today. Make sure that you've signed in and that you sign out and that you complete that evaluation form that we've provided for you, um, or else um, we, we will not be able to get those CEUs to you. We want to get them to you. Um, visit our website. Um, be on the lookout. This is the launch of more programming. Um, so we hope you've enjoyed the program today. Um, be on the lookout um, for our newsletter, et cetera, and other emails. Keep in touch. Let us know. Give us some, some stories, um, any progress that you're making in this arena. We all want to know 
Um, this is an area where we need camaraderie, and we need to, we need strength in numbers, and we need success stories to keep that encouragement going in these um, in when we're trying to pave this this pioneer way. So we want to thank you again for for being with us. Um, we will see you at the next uh, at the next event, and good luck as you try to be a pioneer in this emerging field. So thank you very much.